Hey everyone, welcome to week 15, day three, uh, on our ongoing Earthy Palette Week, four color Earth Palette Week, maybe? Name under construction. So on Monday, we did um, my fellow painter, Tom, and we tried to do like a distorted, sort of um, kind of irregular uh, version of Tom, <laughs> trying to push like little changes of color and little shapes and trying to reconfigure all those things into a, <laughs> a portrait of Tom. On Tuesday, yesterday, Martes de Español, uh, we did Danny on a far more controlled palette. Still some sense of distortion, but you know, uh, there was a naturalist impulse behind that. So I uh, tried to balance that out a little bit. And as I always say, the point is not to just take a couple of colors, you know, a very limited four color palette, and then do the same thing over and over again. The point is to try and push the boundaries of that palette, the limiting nature of that palette, and just try to break it and see, you know, what we can do. So I hope that by the end of the week, we have five paintings that showcase, you know, five possibilities, not the five possibilities, but five possibilities of what you can do with the palette. So let's see how we do today. Okay, let's get started. So as a small recap, let me give you guys a little summary of what has happened in the uh, past two days. I started on Monday with a painting where I wanted to give myself a ton of liberties. And liberties, not so much in the sense that I can just do whatever I want and I'm not bound by anything. No, liberties in the sense that I do see myself, I do understand myself as a representational painter and one whose heart really goes towards the more naturalist side of art. So I really try, you know, at my core to be faithful to nature when I'm trying to paint. But there is another side of me. It's like, this is like a tugging war, but there's, <laughs> there's a, a part of my brain and my heart and my body that's also telling me, but just push, explore. Yes, be faithful to nature. And try and communicate to the viewer and first try and explain to yourself what it is about that you're looking at that is moving you and why you are so eager to try and translate this stimuli into paint. But this fluctuation that I have, this, this constant battle within me where I'm trying to represent, but I'm also trying to express how I feel about the things that I'm representing. I feel that that's been my whole career in the sense that I have been very disciplined with a ton of paintings that I've done over the last 20 years. And then it's almost like very liberating. And I, I almost feel like I, I've granted myself the right to then just take a ton of chances and do weird paintings, just strange, strange paintings where I don't really care what people think, what the gallery director thought. I could care less if it was going to sell or not. I always told myself, okay, if I have a show, I'm going to do X amount of paintings that I know are going to give me a good chance of getting some sales, but I'm also going to give myself a couple of paintings and maybe they were in the minority, but I would always tell myself, okay, I'm going to do these to try and sell, but I'm going to do these two or three just because I need to exhale, just because I need to breathe. And I need to feel that the, the thing that is important to me is not if a painting is going to sell or if it's going to be liked. I don't care about those things. Strangely, and maybe this has happened to a bunch of you people out there, for the past 20 years, I've, I've done a ton of different paintings. And right now, I couldn't sit down and tell you that if I'm going to paint X thing, it's going to be easier to sell than Y. I find that impossible to predict. I remember uh, when I was younger, I used to say, oh, I'm going to do these because people have reacted really well to, let's say, these um, still life elements in one painting. Uh, I'm probably going to do three more. And in my mind, I was already like spending the money. <laughs> I was already like, yeah, these are like totally sold. And then I'm going to do this really weird, you know, distorted body in this room with a strange perspective and nobody's going to like it. And, you know, I don't care. 
And suddenly the first painting that would sell is the distorted one with the weird <laughs> perspective. And the other ones were like super, super hard to sell eventually. So I have learned that I have no idea how a market behaves. I really don't. And every time I feel that something is going to be uh, liked by the majority of people, <laughs> I get a lesson in humility. And it's always like, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. Just paint and don't care about these things because these are things that you can't control. You really, really can't control. Maybe, maybe for other painters that do have like a product and people have very specific expectations of what a product should look like, maybe for those painters, it is okay to have a sort of formula where they build their paintings. But that's never been me. It, it never has. I have been a painter for, you know, however long my career has been that just paints, you know, whatever the hell I want. I'm really that almost <laughs> capricious. I just have ideas in my mind and some of them have worked out. And for the paintings that haven't been successful, I just paint over them. And, and sometimes this is the most painful part. You know, this feeling just invaded my body and my mind while I was talking about this, but... There's nothing weirder than knowing, just knowing, being fully conscious that you're doing a strange painting that probably nobody's going to like and it's not going to sell and you were probably right. Nobody liked it and nobody wanted to buy it. And you know this within the first couple of sittings that you have with the painting and you already know this, but for some reason you keep going and you know this painting's going to be a quote unquote failure uh, but it doesn't matter. And it's not going to be like a commercial failure, but a critical success. No, no, nobody's going to like it. Nobody's going to buy it. I mean, it's like a fail, fail thing. But you have to see it through. I am super committed to what I do. And I always just, I leave a painting whenever I feel I'm done. Not when I'm just tired and I'm like, oh God, can't do anything else. But when I consciously say, okay, this is really as far as I can take it. This is as far as my ability lets me take this painting. And I love that about painting, that you already know. You already know you're in a battle you're going to lose, and the battle scars are not even going to be that cool or sexy. <laughs> They're just going to be kind of pathetic. <laughs> you're just going to waste probably a month and a half or two months. Maybe after that, you probably question yourself because you think, oh my God, I could have been painting something that was going to sell for sure. And so I love that painters, artists, we can put ourselves in a situation where we know this effort is going to be unsuccessful. And yet we just keep going. We really just keep going and we see it through. And there's nothing like that lesson, you know, teaching yourself, hey, you had an idea, just see it through. Maybe it wasn't a great idea, but just see it through. Because if you renounce that idea, if you teach yourself to just start and then say, well, this is probably not going to work. And then you just let the painting go and you put it to the side. You're never going to really investigate the borders, the parameters of your ability. Those edges where you have to push, push, push to realize what kind of artist you're going to be. Sometimes you realize that you hit a wall and, you know, that wall can be knowledge or experience or ability. And at some point in time, it's unsurmountable. It's not like you can just do one painting and out of pure will, you can make an amazing painting out of it just by hacking at it throughout a year or 20 years or 30 years. It doesn't really work like that. If all you needed to do a painting was a big heart, then then just keep whacking at it and you'll probably be able to, to get to some magical place after a while. But the truth is, it doesn't work that way. It really doesn't work that way. And I've talked about how there are certain experiences in painting where you feel like you're gliding and it's super easy and it's super comfortable that when you're done and you realize you ended up with a great painting, you're like, wow, is this what painting really feels like when you're super connected and everything is just falling into place? And that gives you such a false sense of security because those paintings are such a small minority of what you're going to do in your career. I mean, they, they don't exemplify the wholeness of your career at all. 
what's normal about painting, what is going to happen throughout our lives is that we struggle. So the experience that we're going to see the most, that we're going to go through, is the one where you just, oof, where you have to fight through it. But there's also that small minority where you're going to have to just like claw your way out of a bad painting. And there's no light at the end of that tunnel because you clawed your way out of it and it was still a bad painting. Yeah. <laughs> and we have to come to terms with that. And you have to look at it and say, wow, this, this battle was tough. This battle was tough. And we need those moments too. We don't need every painting to be an absolute success. We really don't. We need those moments where we are investigating how far we can push, how much we think we know, how solid our foundations are, because those are the moments that are going to teach us. Maybe what they taught us is something that we don't have access and we won't have access uh, to it for months, maybe, maybe years. You know, this is tough. This is one of the toughest things about learning. Maybe what you learn from an unsuccessful painting only only gets understood by your brain and by your sensitivity, you know, three, four years later. I know that that sounds ugh, so tough because it is so, so tough when you hear somebody tell you that. But what they don't tell you is that when you do get it, oh my God, it's like your whole body is like ascending to another level. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this light in your body is just shining through your skin. It's incredible. It's the most incredible feeling when you get it, when you get things that you weren't able to get at some point of your life. And it's amazing. And we have to fight for those. And I think that those paintings that we may think, oh, what did I do for the past two months? What did I do with my life? Why did I listen to myself? trying to do this dumb painting just out of pure whim. Um, I always tell people, listen to those moments because they, they actually kind of remind you that painting is not effective, it's not efficient, it's not meant to be. I know it goes against everything that just this contemporary life tells us because we have to be efficient and we have to try and paint and the painting has to sell and then we take that money and we pay rent and we pay our cell phone and we pay our cable bill and if you have kids you pay for school and you pay for food and you pay for everything and it's this kind of well-oiled machine. You, you do an intelligent painting and it sells and you use that money and then you can buy stuff and you're happy. <laughs> yeah, but no. <laughs> Art doesn't really work that way. And I think we have to let ourselves also have moments where we say, hey, you know what? I'm going to take a chance. And maybe taking this chance is not, is not just a thing about a couple of hours. It's not just a thing about a couple of weeks. I really need to fail horribly for two months. And that's amazing. And you can't beat yourself up for granting yourself this right. I love these exercises because... They put me in this mindset where I fluctuate between taking chances or doing something that I can do naturally. And some paintings, I like to, you know, be kind of faithful and, and have a very sensitive hand as much as as sensitive as my hand can be. We've already established that I have hands that weigh like mastodons. So <laughs> small hands, small hands, but they weigh a ton. <laughs> so... I don't have a very soft touch with my paintings. I, I'm totally, totally aware of that. But I give myself a chance where I can explore that more sensitive, controlled side. And like I said, I usually have a tendency to love that because I absolutely love nature. But I also want to see how I feel about nature. If I, if I let that loose, if I let those feelings loose... What can happen? What are the limits of that? Where can that take me? And that's so, so amazing and so gratifying. And I think that that feeds my spirit and it gives me energy. And then when I feel like I have gone way too far, then I tell myself, okay, rein it back in. And remember, yeah, you've been having fun for a couple of months, but remember to be disciplined also. So it's always this fight against taking chances and being disciplined. And I think Mondays and Tuesday painting reflect that perfectly. 
One, I break everything apart with Tom's portrait. You know, it's elongated, it's distorted, it's broken. And with Danny, because I knew that I had taken all those chances, yesterday's painting, I told myself, okay, rein it back in, just try to do something a little more solid. And I, I liked it. I liked that I, I could, again, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. And even though Danny's painting doesn't look like it's broken, it really does have a lot of very singular decisions. It's all very gray, but there's areas that are uh, like a gray, red, gray, yellow, gray, green. So the grayness, the tonal quality of the painting is actually binding all those little brush strokes together. But it is broken. It just doesn't have as many hues as Tom's painting did on, on Monday. But because I felt that I was breaking it a little too much, I told myself, okay, let's do something super simple today. And instead of just breaking the painting in all these hues that are available to me, because now that I've done two paintings, I've realized, wow, this palette, even though it's a very grounded, earthy palette, is giving me so much access to hues. There's such a beautiful range of harmonious hues that I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Like I could sleep here. <laughs> it's a haystack, but I could sleep in this haystack forever. <laughs> it may be ugly looking. It may not be super comfortable, but it is perfect. It is, <laughs> it is absolutely perfect. So I told myself, okay, let's take it down even one more notch and say, what if we just take two complementary colors out of this gray earthy palette and construct a portrait with these two. And what I gave myself the opportunity to do with my mother was just say, okay, it's all about these gray reds and these gray greens, and let's put them together. And this is the cool part. And this is what complementary colors do that's actually quite fascinating, which is that when you put them together, when you put one brush stroke on top of another one, or even one brush stroke right next to another one, they don't feel like they're literally right next to each other. They feel like they have depth to them. So you can actually speak about one color receding and then one color coming forward, which is so weird. I mean, this is one of the most incredible, amazing qualities of oil paint, which is that based on the colors that you put right next to each other, they can actually speak about space which is insane if you think about it. It's absolutely insane because it is like alchemy. It's like magic. The fact that you just put a greenish gray and suddenly a grayish red, just the, <laughs> the red pops forward. And you're like, what the hell? How did that happen? Like, how does that work? It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And it's such a human way to see things because this is entirely based on how we perceive the visible spectrum of color. And it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. So this has everything to do with our eyes and our brains and our sensitivity and the way we perceive nature. So I told myself, great, this painting is going to be 90% just a gray red and a gray green. And then 10% is going to be her sweater that's going to be a very cool gray, just to break that up a little bit. But I wanted to see if I could get those really big relationships working and if they could communicate with power and strength and clarity a portrait that is hopefully full of expression because every time I paint my mom I always feel like I can tap into something that I can't with anyone else uh, my mother is the person in this world with whom I've had the most contact with in my whole life that's the person that you know the most in your life. And I'm, I'm blessed to have that relationship with my mom. So whenever I paint her, I, I always feel I can go like a little step forward. Like there's something there, like a shorthand with my mom that enables me to portray her simpler, but more powerfully than people that I tend to struggle with portraying. So I thought my mom was going to be perfect for this exercise because I knew I had to try and do something simple and strong and it had to be like a punch, like super, super strong just to see if this palette could have that, could give me the ability to, to communicate quickly, very, very quickly. So I was very, very happy with that.
So like I said, if I had to describe myself as a painter, it's a painter that fluctuates. I Galleries have hated me for years for this same reason because they always tell me, I don't know what I'm going to get with you. And I'm like, yeah, I, I don't either. <laughs> I don't either. I wake up and I have no clue what I'm going to paint. And I love my life. I love living my life like that. I love that comfort in uncertainty and just trying to navigate that. And yeah, sometimes it makes me anxious. But like I said, it, it it's not about living a life where you just avoid that anxiety. It's about living a life where that anxiety is part of it. And you just understand that as your companion. And that's it. You don't fear it. And you just know it's always going to be there. And it doesn't scare you anymore. Uh, so that was my mom's painting today. Again, exploring possibilities of representation with this palette. I'm super happy with how it came out. And this is the coolest part. Sometimes I always think, oh, this project is comprised by individual paintings. You know, and, and with Danny, we've done, I don't know, you know, over 70 paintings maybe. And it is not. It is, it is, it, it's a project that's not about making painting after painting after painting after painting. You know, it's not about an individual painting. It is about the act of painting. That's what's most valuable. So I think I'm, I'm super happy the way my body and my mind and the paintings that I'm doing reflect the way I'm understanding the project. So that's super invigorating. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Uh, we'll have our fourth day and hopefully we can keep doing the same thing, which is, again, pushing, finding possibilities. Thank you guys for hanging out. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.